to hear <laughs> with a bouquet of what is blooming. We've got honeysuckle. There's a few more flowers. I have a modest honeysuckle bush. It's best not to let them uh, start germinating and growing in the woods because they are non-natives. And I've got spirea, which is also called bridal wreath. And I've got lilies of the valley, which are plants low to the ground. Uh, they are poisonous, so some people don't plant them where the animals or the little kids might be. And then this is my sweet little Dutzia that's at one corner of the front of my house. And I'm probably going to put this and fill out this bouquet a little bit more at uh, a grave of someone who died more than 200 years ago, <laughs> a woman. And I have a little uh, glass, a little plastic glass that I weigh down with some stones. And especially uh, before Mother's Day, um, I like to do something like that. I have a feeling that it's entirely possible that she was one of those young women who died in childbirth along with her infant. And uh, so it isn't really sad to me. It's, it's a part of women's history. Um, and uh, I really think it's so important to recognize the real historic women who we should not be going around saying actually are non-binary or didn't want to be women uh, or some other false narrative that comes out of gender ideology. Uh, oh, I just wanted to show you this too. This is a little makeup mirror. <laughs> I really don't use it when I'm applying my minimal makeup, <laughs> but I use it to uh, search on my body for uh, deer ticks when I come in. And this time of the year, the nymphs are very, very small. And I think I got one off of my arm uh, the other day and I'm, I took a very small tweezers. I tried doing the trick with dish soap. If you put, um, on on uh, uh, one hundred percent <laughs> dish soap on <clears throat> a place where a tick is, it's supposed to force it to come out. That's just a little tip. Uh, I'm really not worried that I'm going to end up getting Lyme disease. Um, I have started though doing tick checks uh, twice a day, and I wear the long sleeves and tuck in my long pants and all this when I'm working outside. That's what I recommend because otherwise we are forcing ourselves inside. Now, I just want to uh, bring up three main studies that are, are going to get cited as the cases start uh, in the states like Florida, Utah, Montana, uh, which have outlawed uh, what is euphemistically called gender affirming care. I call it uh, cross sex treatment. I think that is much more accurate as is cross sex ideation. In fact, I am going to um, put this video on the playlist of uh, the Hagen lexicon. Um, I think it's important when you are countering this with friends and family that you tell them that when they say gender affirming care, when they say gender dysphoria, when they say transgender, they are using coerced, brainwashed, captured terms. And it's, it's unthinkable that a positive phrase like gender affirming care could actually mean that you are subjecting a child to, um, uh, is it uh, a gonadotropin agonist, and gonadotropin agonists, which stop gonad is your your sex organs, so it's the um, you know 
hormones that your sex organs in puberty start to produce that bring on puberty, adolescence, changing the child body into the adult body. And there are a lot of um, experts, actual qualified quality experts telling us that it's very important for the development of the brain to have this wash of the testosterone if you're a male and the estrogens if you're a female going through puberty, your brain will remain undeveloped in a certain way because puberty brings on mature maturation and uh, the, the way the brain is affected continues all the way until age 25 for maturation. So the first study I'm going to cite is the Cecilia at Dana et al. study from 2011 from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And Dana is spelled D-H-E-I-N-E. -E. Um, I'm going to try to put the links uh, in the notes here, but it's better for the links to go to my blog, Uta Hegen Grass Widow, that's U-T-E-H-E-G-G-E-N-G-R-A-S-S-W-I-D-O dot wordpress dot com. So, because those are posted there, I think when I put links, they ask me for other personal information at YouTube, and I, I really don't like giving that out. So, um, I, I actually recommend my blog, my WordPress blog. You will find a great deal of information. Now, the Swedish study is an interesting one. Um, it is the first one that I know of that is studying death records. There is a second one from the Heritage Foundation regarding uh, youth and young adult suicide. Now, this Swedish study compared the death records of people who had died before 2011 and the group that they were really looking at was Swedes who had had cross-sex treatment, meaning possible, possibly puberty blockers if they started young enough, then hormones, then surgeries. I'm going to call them the post-op group because they were able to do an age-matched and socioeconomic status matched cohort, a group of people who weren't diagnosed with cross-sex ideation or with this psychiatric illness, and they were matched according to probably income status. So you know that uh, that's just something that would affect the outcomes and they're trying to eliminate extraneous um, outside influences like how the wealth and and of course an uh, an indicator is is age so they were age matched so there was the swedish uh i'm going to say the word normal normal cohort group and there was the swedish post-op group and it was uh enough hundred people to be statistically significant in some way. They compared the death records. So they're not interviewing people about how they feel. They're just looking at the records. The post-op group had had their operations between 1973 and 2003. Their death records were examined for how many of them took their own life. And originally, um, in this study, they separated out natal females from natal males. Then they looked at the cohort group, the matched group, who had not had the, the cross-sex treatments because they didn't have this psychiatric illness. And they looked at how often did it happen that the post-op group took their own lives compared to the normal um, control group. And the males was somewhere between 18 and 19 percent times higher 
in the post-op group to have taken their own lives. That is natal males who had opted into a female persona and done all of those cross-sex treatments. Natal males in the control group were not found to commit suicide so often. They also looked at the rates of cancer and the researchers could not decide. They just said, well, we don't know if it's, uh, if it's statistically significant. There seemed to be a higher rate of cancer, which makes sense, in the post-op group, which of course they had been taking wrong sex hormones. For the natal females in the post-op group, the shocker, the post-op females who had had those operations between 1973 and uh, 2003 committed suicide at a higher rate than the control group females who were age matched at a rate of 40 times higher. And what's really, really alarming about this is that the researchers hid that data point. Dr. Stephen B. Levine, who has done expert testimony about this, brought out that fact because what they did was they combined the data of the natal females and natal males in the post-op group examined so that it looked like a slightly lower rate, which is, this is very anti-female to have then said, oh, well, the female side of this doesn't look good, so we're going to hide it. Now, it's, it's also true that in the Irwig study from last fall, from October or November of 2022, uh, the females who were taking wrong sex hormones, this was a study of dependence of military personnel in the US. So they have just those medical records. Uh, they found that in four years of the records of uh, fulfilling of filling prescriptions for wrong sex hormones, that females stopped the the records of them getting more testosterone stopped at a rate of about a third. And it was very young kids. It, it's an admission that kids as young as 13 or 14 girls were taking testosterone. And there is uh, no other information about uh, any of these uh, girls and what their mental health outcomes were. They, they only looked at records. So the Swedish study um, only looked at death records. The Irwig, uh, uh, I think it's I-R-W-I-G, it's in my blog, my WordPress blog. The Irwig study was also just a study of records, not interviewing anybody, just looking at the records. And males in the study who were from the teen years until age 22 or so um, stopped uh, filling their uh, estrogen prescriptions at a rate close to 20%. For the rate of stopping testosterone among the natal females, it was about a third, about 33%. So there's the studies of records. Then there's the Dutch study. Now, the Dutch study from 2014 of De Vries, Martinius, and Stiersma um, was uh, funded by the Faring, F-E-R-R-I-N-G, pharmaceutical company that makes puberty blockers. They started out with 70. They did not have a control group. They just had 70 uh, identified patients who supposedly had gone through some kind of psychological testing 
and were found not to have other problems like autism or OCD or ADD, they filtered that out, which is not being done here in the United States. And uh, within a short time at the beginning of this study, then all of a sudden 15 people dropped out. They didn't follow up uh, to ask why they dropped out. They uh, entered a, um, a, a data point about a survey that they made up of survey for girls who wanted to be boys and surveys for boys who wanted to be girls and do you, uh, how do you feel about this part of your body? And in the follow-up, what they did was they switched the surveys and they gave natal males who were ideating that they were females the survey for females. And so it meant that there were some questions that um, they didn't, it didn't apply to them. Why would they be writing about whether or not their period bothers them. That was one of the questions. And so the, the entire um, out uh, final uh, survey information uh, release kind of uh, piece of this study, of the Dutch study, which is the foundation for what's called the Dutch protocols, which means, yes, oh yeah, we need to give you puberty blockers and they're not paying attention to any of the problems with the skeletal system, with liver failure, with heart conditions, all of these problems with these drugs in the Dutch study. Uh, it became 55, so N used to be 70, then it became 55, no answers to why. Why did so many people drop out? Why weren't there any interviews about them, about if they felt better about their own body, their own natal body? Then what did they do to feel better? Maybe we should know something about what happened because maybe that could help people. For sure they did not do what is known as conversion therapy. That's another nonsense word from that side. Now, then 55 became 53 because one of them died at the age of 18 after having what is euphemistically called vaginoplasty. And he, after the surgery, uh, inserting, I think, uh, part of his bowel. Yes, this is what it is. Uh, they couldn't do the what's called penile inversion probably because of the puberty blockers, uh, same thing as uh, I Am Jazz story. So they used part of the intestine and uh, to make a, a tunnel uh, for the purpose of apparently penetrative uh, sexual, um, heterosexual sex, which again doesn't make any sense because <laughs> uh, it's not doing what the vagina does during sex. Go to my other video about the sexual realities for that. So that person out of 55, one out of 55 dies of the surgery basically, because what happened was E. coli from the bowel uh, festered in this uh, tube um, and it caused him to have necrosis and they couldn't uh, keep him alive even with all of their high-tech uh, anti antibiotics and so on. Okay, then there was one more person who had gone through uh, these years, it's three to four years, of this so-called affirmation. That person committed suicide. So that kind of goes along with the study that was recently published from Dr. Lauren Chen that I blogged about a couple of posts ago where they had in four clinics 315 uh, 
subjects who were tw ages 12 to 20, and uh, it was found that two of them committed suicide after the affirmative care. Now, um, a so-called, after the cross-sex treatments. See, if you call it cross-sex treatments, then it starts to be more logical. So the rate of suicide is actually higher after the cross-sex treatments. And the lack of diagnosis of coexisting other conditions like OCD, like uh, autism and ADD and ADHD plus PTSD from traumatic experiences, that all is not healed by all of this uh, affirmative care. <laughs> So all of these studies are at my blog, and um, I recommend going directly to the links. It's going to be important. These uh, lawsuits that the ACLU and some other advocacy organizations are, in, are initiating uh, now that several states have made it illegal to do cross-sex treatment to children, including puberty blockers, wrong sex hormones, and surgeries. Those organizations that want this to happen willy-nilly to any confused child who wants it, they are taking those state governments to court. And I think that this is not such a bad thing. We're going to get tired of it. We're going to get tired of it in the news. It's very exhausting. However, it will take things to higher courts and the mainstream media will have to report on it finally. Also, uh, be sure to follow Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, who is talking about this very openly. He has a degree in biology from uh, Harvard, and I think he has a law degree from Yale. And he's tossed his hat in the ring for uh, the presidential primary, and he's been bringing all of this up um, in his campaign interviews. And therefore, finally, some of this is going to get on mainstream media. And I hope that uh, everyone can start understanding the importance of the Hagen lexicon and to know that captured language is not going to lead us to the truth. So off I go to put out my little bouquet. Thank you. Be sure to like and subscribe. We're up to something like 916.